All right, so today I'm going to be teaching you about the economical concepts of absolute and comparative advantage. These are really, really important for understanding trade, okay? So you have to know these if you want to have an opinion on trade, free trade, whatever you want to call it, and understand trade. Now, comparative advantage is the economical basis for trading. Uh, I'm going to show you absolute advantage anyways, but this is an outdated concept that simply doesn't really... Uh, apply to anything anymore so um, we're gonna look here at absolute advantage okay and this is really important stuff because again you have to know this to understand uh, trade now absolute advantage simply compares the numbers that uh, two nations can make of the same good so if we take two countries uh, let's say the US and let's say the UK and so we're going to compare here cars, right? You have cars. And then let's say planes over here. So let's say the U.S. can make 80 cars and 80 planes, all right? And then let's say the U.K. can make 100 cars, um, but they can make 400 planes. Now, all absolute advantage looks at is comparing the numbers that can be created of a certain good by two countries. So you just look at cars. Who can make more cars? Well, it's the United Kingdom. So the UK, in this case, has an absolute advantage. It's very basic stuff. Uh, the UK has an absolute advantage in producing uh, cars. Okay? So they can make cars. Uh, they can make more cars. Um, now, who has the absolute advantage when it comes to um, planes? Well, the UK also has absolute advantage in creating planes, right? Um, they have the absolute advantage in both uh, goods. So this is very basic, very simple to understand. But again, this is a very outdated concept that's not used in terms of trade calculations, really. Um, and so it has an absolute advantage in creating both planes and cars. But there's another concept known as comparative advantage. Now, comparative advantage, this is really the important stuff because this is what is really used to determine trade. And so it's super, super important. Please try to understand comparative advantage. Now, I'm going to have to open up a different window for this because there's not enough room. Um, so we're going to talk about comparative advantage. Now, what is comparative advantage? It's obviously the idea that certain countries are better at creating certain things in comparison to others. So, you know, obviously it doesn't make sense to produce something that's not economically efficient when taking the opportunity cost into account. But when it comes to trade, uh, think about it as certain countries simply can't make goods as efficiently as other countries. So a lot of that due to natural resources, culture, expertise levels, etc. And so it doesn't make sense for like the USA to drill or try to make all of its own oil. It makes sense for it to trade with Middle Eastern countries that have an easier time making oil because of their natural resources. So would it make sense? A lot of times countries simply can't produce goods, you know, just because natural resources don't allow it um, or maybe their location or terrain. So certain countries are better at creating certain goods. Um, and so even though you saw what you saw in the uh, example of the uh, absolute advantage, comparative advantage is going to be different. And so as you guys saw there, right, the U.S. is losing in both realms. So what do they create, right? Because they have a absolute, the U.K. has an absolute advantage in creating both cars and planes. So we're just going to import uh, that example into here and do the same calculation for comparative advantage. So you got the U.S., you got the U.K., and uh, you got cars, and you got planes, okay? So for cars, it's 80. The U.S. can produce 80 cars. They can produce 80 planes. The U.K. can produce 100 cars, and it can produce 400 planes. So despite having an absolute advantage in both areas, you don't need an absolute advantage to produce something. You need a comparative advantage. So how do you find comparative advantage? Well, you calculate it via opportunity cost. So you're comparing the opportunity cost of two goods for one nation. So you're comparing for each car that you made, what did you miss out on? <clears throat> for each car that you made, how many planes could you have made in its place? That's opportunity cost, right? If you don't know what opportunity cost is, go watch my video on it. 
it's missing out on the next best option. But specifically, we're comparing two goods. So you're comparing what you could have missed out on. So first, we're going to calculate the opportunity cost of cars for both nations. Okay, so we're going to put here, we're going to put cars OC. Okay, it's going to be opportunity cost. So the way to calculate opportunity cost is you take the secondary good and divide it by the primary goods number. So if we're looking at cars, that means you take 80 planes. Whoa, that is awful. Uh, you take 80 planes and you divide it by 80 cars. Okay, and that gives you one uh, plane is your opportunity cost for making each car. So what that means is for each car that you made, you could have created a plane. That's what you missed out on because you chose to make a car you missed out on being able to make a plane because you've limited resources. So this is what the U.S., this is their opportunity cost for creating planes. Now, what is the U.K.'s opportunity cost when it comes to creating planes? Well, again, you take 400 planes because we're calculating it for cars. Take 400 planes over 100 cars. This is going to give you four planes. So that is a ginormous, ginormous opportunity cost. Because that means for each car that you produced, you could have made four planes. That's a lot of missed out economical profit and gains. And so the way you determine comparative advantage, you simply look at which country has the lower opportunity cost for a certain good. So for producing cars, who has the lowest opportunity cost? Well, in this case, the USA has a far, far, far lower um it's like a four times lower, essentially, opportunity cost. So that means that the U.S. will produce cars because they have a much lower opportunity cost. The U.K. has a gigantic opportunity cost. They're losing out on four planes for each car that they decide to make. That is just absolutely awful. Um, now, uh, I'm trying to figure out where I should uh, actually write this. Let's, let's put this over here. <clears throat> so let's say you're now calculating the planes opportunity cost, right? So you're looking at planes OC. I'm going to move this over because I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm going to move this over here. Um, so again, it's 80, 80. So for the U S an easy calculation on this part, it's 80 over 80. But again, remember if you're finding the opportunity cost for planes, you take the number of cars produced and then divide it by the number of planes. Okay. So that means, uh, your OC is one car. It means you're missing out on a car that you could have made for each plane that you decided to make. So every plane that you made, you could have made a car in its place. So that for both its opportunity cost is one. Now, what is the UK's opportunity cost for um, for creating planes? So if you're calculating that, you take the amount of cars and you divide it by the amount of planes that they created, which means 100 over 400. So what you end up getting is one-fourth car opportunity cost. So what does that mean? Again, to repeat over and over again, for every plane that you decided to make, you only missed out on 0.25 of a car. Okay, and considering planes will go for more, you know, obviously it makes more sense anyways, but almost any good you can make that way is better. So for each car, that, for each plane that you made, you only missed out on one-fourth of a car. That's a very good opportunity cost. But regardless, their opportunity cost is like four times lower in this situation um, than, the U, uh, than the U.S. So in this situation, com according to comparative advantage, the U.K. will create cars and the U.S. will create planes. And then what will end up happening is they'll just trade for whatever deficit they have in the other good. They'll just trade and then you'll be able to get to a point where you, you know, maybe you're at an equilibrium of goods. Um, but this is the most economically efficient way to reach it because both countries are better at producing uh, the other goods. So instead of wasting a bunch of money and coming out with less products in total, um, you can trade instead and be the most economically efficient. So this here is the uh, bedrock for trade, understanding trade, why countries trade, period, how do they trade? It's comparative advantage, and comparative advantage uses opportunity cost calculations between two goods to determine what to create. So let's go back to the absolute example, right? absolute advantage so in this situation the uk has an absolute advantage in both cars but that doesn't in both goods cars and airplanes but it doesn't mean that they should make both cars and airplanes um what it means is really 
uh, they should make the UK should make cars because they're more efficient at making cars um, compared to making uh, you know make it more efficient at creating planes than they are making cars. So the UK should make planes. The US should make cars. Okay, I don't know if I. Uh, mixed that up earlier but the uk should make planes the u.s should make cars okay um because they have better opportunity cost ratios so again for each plane for each car that the u.s makes they lose out on a plane but the uk for every car they make they miss out on four planes which is again gigantic opportunity cost uh for planes uh for each you know plane that the u.s makes they miss out on a car the UK only misses out on one fourth of a car for each plane that they make. So that means that they should create planes because their opportunity cost is lower. So this here is the basis for trade, understand comparative advantage. And this is why trade is good, okay? Because it leads to the most economically efficient scenario. And it does not lead to a scenario in which there's efficiency loss because you created goods that costed you more, that cost you more than it would to trade. So you would trade for whatever deficits you have in goods, and it would result in a more economic efficient result if you're at an equilibrium of both goods, if you want to be, um, because it simply costs less to produce that. It makes more sense to produce it this way. So this will lead us into uh, more trade topics as well.